Almost 30 years ago, back before Java even hit version 1.0, the Gang of Four published a book that became a classic in our industry. It's Design Patterns, Elements of Reusable Object-Oriented Software. And in the introduction of this book, the authors stated the principle, favor object composition over class inheritance. And like all memorable quotes, I think the principle itself became way more popular than the context in which it was originally stated. And so a lot of developers have kind of held to that principle dogmatically without really weighing the advantages and disadvantages of each approach. So today in this video, we're gonna take time to understand inheritance and composition. We'll get a feel for the trade-offs involved. And then we're gonna look at what I believe to be an underrated feature in Kotlin that can help change our perspective on it. So let's start with inheritance. Even if you're relatively new to software development, if you're using an object-oriented programming language, you almost certainly understand the idea of inheritance. Let's take a look at a simple code example, and we'll examine the characteristics that this design choice gives us. So here we've got a simple model for a vehicle, and it's responsible for keeping track of its speed, and that speed increases whenever we call the accelerate function here. And it also has this function named make engine sound. Remember in Kotlin that if we want to be able to extend a class, we have to explicitly state our intention by using the open modifier on the class and on the members that we want the subclasses to be able to override. So down here, we have a class named race car and it's a subclass of vehicle. So that means it does everything that a vehicle does, but instead of making the default vehicle sound, it makes this sound here. Now race car has a speed property and an accelerate function even though we don't declare them in the body of this class. It inherits them from the vehicle class. And race car is also a subtype of vehicle. So for example, a function that can only work with vehicle objects can still work with a race car object. So to demonstrate that, let's move these lines down to their own function. I'm gonna refactor this with the extract method in IntelliJ. I'm gonna actually just use uh, control alt M and we'll call this new function drive. And we'll rename this to vehicle. And we'll change the type of this parameter to vehicle. And as we can see, everything compiles just fine. It's possible to pass a race car object to a function that expects a vehicle because race car is a subtype of vehicle. Awesome. Okay, we can run this and we'll see the output that we expect. It prints out the engine sound and then after accelerating twice, the speed is 4.0. So what are the characteristics that we've noticed about inheritance here? Well, as we just saw, inheritance gives us a subtyping relationship between race car and vehicle. So we can substitute a race car anywhere that a vehicle is expected. And this increases flexibility because it gives us options. We can pass either a race car or a vehicle where a vehicle object is expected. Another characteristic we see is that there is a relationship between these two classes and it's de declared statically. So we have this static reference to vehicle here. And because vehicle is a class rather than an interface, this means that every race car object depends on the implementation of vehicle. So this characteristic decreases flexibility because race car is stuck with a single implementation. However, this is advantageous for making the code more understandable. Like you can easily jump to the definition for a vehicle and see what its implementation is. So this characteristic has some trade-offs. Finally, uh, the member functions and properties are pulled in automatically for us, which is pretty cool. So in other words, we don't have to declare speed or accelerate here in the subclass at all. We only included the one function that we wanted to override. So that's a plus one for convenience and for concise code. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, inheritance is only one way of designing our code. We can also use composition. So let's take the code that we've written so far and restructure it so that it uses composition instead. Okay, since we don't wanna use inheritance, the first thing we can do is remove this open keyword on the vehicle class and on this function here. When we do this, we get a couple of errors and that's fine, that's what we're expecting. We're no longer able to extend it in the race car class, so that's great. So let's remove the inheritance here. And we'll also remove the override keyword here. And then in the constructor, instead of accepting the acceleration, we'll just accept an actual vehicle object, making it a property of the race car class. Now, when we construct a race car down here, we'll need to pass a vehicle. So we'll just wrap that acceleration in a call to the vehicle constructor. 
The race car doesn't have any definition for speed or accelerate, so we're going to need to add those members. And we'll just forward any requests for those members to the underlying object here. So we'll use a getter for speed so that we always get the latest value that way. And we'll forward the accelerate function as well. At this point, race car has all the same properties and functions as vehicle, but we still have this error here. We can't pass it to a function that accepts a vehicle because with our updated design, race car is no longer a subtype of vehicle. And since Kotlin is a statically typed language, we have to actually declare the subtype relationship. It's not good enough to simply have the same property and function signatures like you can do with other dynamically typed languages like Ruby. So the solution is to use an interface. Let's use IntelliJ's refactoring tools to do this one for us. I'm going to place the cursor up here. And I'm going to go to Refactor, Introduce Interface. I'm going to select all the members here. And we actually want the speed to be a read-only val. Uh, this is going to make it a var. So we'll just go ahead and create the code and change this to val. And then we need to declare that uh, race car is a subtype of iVehicle and make sure that we add the override keywords on these three members. And finally, we just look for any parameters, uh, properties, and variables that refer to the vehicle class, and we're going to update them to use the iVehicle interface instead. So here, and here, just like that. Now, when making this change, we end up with kind of an awkward naming situation. We've got an interface named iVehicle and a class named Vehicle. And some developers prefer to name the interface as the unadorned name, so just Vehicle, and then they would name the class Vehicle Impl for vehicle implementation. And that's kind of awkward, too. Uh, sometimes I'll name the class something like Simple Vehicle or Basic Vehicle. But you know what? In this video, let's just go with it. Let's embrace the awkwardness, and we'll stick with iVehicle and Vehicle. So we can run this code and we can see that we'll get the same output as we had last time. So this code does the same thing as our inheritance code did, but it's a few lines longer. So what are the characteristics of this approach compared to the inheritance approach? Well, first, there's no subtype relationship between race car and vehicle. So we can't substitute a race car for a vehicle as we saw. Uh, we did introduce a, an interface though, so we can use that instead. So we might consider this a disadvantage that we had to create an additional type with iVehicle up here. Now, race car has no direct dependency on the vehicle class. It only has a dependency on the interface, iVehicle. So we're not actually coupled to the implementation of vehicle. And this one is a massive boost to flexibility. And I'll show you what I mean in just a minute. And then third, race car uses speed and accelerate from the interface, but we had to manually include them here by simply forwarding each one to the vehicle object. So they didn't come in automatically for us like they did with the inheritance approach. We had to add this boilerplate. So here, more boilerplate, more noise. OK, now it's worth taking a moment to consider the benefits of having no static dependency on this vehicle class. So in our original code with the inheritance approach, we declared that dependency right here. And I hope you like that implementation because you're stuck with it. Uh, every single instance of a race car is going to use that implementation of vehicle. So let's say that we were to introduce another kind of iVehicle called Junker. And this Junker is an iVehicle that just doesn't go anywhere. Its speed stays at zero no matter how much you accelerate. So with our composition approach, we can just go down here and instantiate another race car using this Junker. And everything just works. It won't budge because it's a Junker. And in fact, we can even change this out at runtime if we want. So instead of creating a second race car object, if we make this vehicle property public and mutable by changing it to var instead of uh, val, then we can reassign it like this. And we have none of those options over here with this inheritance approach. We're stuck with nothing but the one vehicle class. And so that's a lot of flexibility that we get with composition. So on the whole, composition is a lot more flexible than inheritance. Flexible code can be harder to understand, though, because there are a lot more objects and types that are involved. So if you don't need all of this flexibility, then it's totally fine to just use inheritance. When we say favor object composition over class inheritance, it doesn't mean that you should never use inheritance. 
In fact, the Design Patterns book points out that they both have their advantages and disadvantages and that they can work together. So each project is unique. Some characteristics will be more valuable in certain projects than in other projects. And it's your job as a developer to evaluate those characteristics and determine the design that's most appropriate for your app. And that's the hard work of being a software engineer. So looking back over the trade-offs, there are a lot of great advantages to using composition, but one disadvantage is the increased amount of code. And some of that code is due to the new interface that we created up here. And some is because we had to manually forward calls like we're doing here. And it's not too bad when it's just a couple, but the more members that your interface has, the more boilerplate is going to be required. So as we've already seen, this interface gives us some advantages with flexibility, but the boilerplate, it really just kind of adds noise and uh, requires more effort for us to actually see the differences between race car and vehicle. It'd be great if we could get the best of both worlds. Like what if we could compose like we're inheriting? What if we could get the flexibility of composition with the concise readable syntax that comes with inheritance? Well, thankfully, Kotlin gives us a feature called class delegation. To use class delegation, we can just add by vehicle here. And this means that anytime we call speed or accelerate or make engine sound, Kotlin will automatically forward those calls to this vehicle object for us, unless we manually override it here in race car. And this means we no longer need to manually include speed or accelerate, so we can take those out here. But we want to leave make engine sound because uh, we want race car to provide its own implementation. And by the way, we don't even need this to be a property anymore. Like we can remove private val and everything works just fine. But it's also fine to keep it as a property in case you do need to reference it for some reason. We can run this code and see that we've got the same output as before. So by using delegation, we've got many of the same benefits of composition with a class definition that's about as lightweight as the inheritance approach had. Now Kotlin's class delegation does have a few limitations that are worth noting. One is that the implementation can only be set when you're constructing the object. So if we change this constructor parameter and make it mutable, we can try to set our vehicle to junker just like we did before, but it's not gonna have any effect on the delegation. This is not a compiler error, but the IDE will give us a warning about this. Also, this kind of delegation is referred to as simple delegation or as forwarding because it simply forwards each function or property to the delegate, uh, but the delegate has no reference back to the caller. So let's say that our vehicle class has a call to make engine sound inside accelerate so that every time you accelerate, it makes the engine sound. If we wanted to convert this to object composition, it won't be as easy as just using Kotlin's class delegation because it'll end up calling this function instead of this one. And to fix this, we might just need to surface this call as a constructor parameter instead, uh, but we'll have to save that for another video sometime. So delegation is a great way to get many of the advantages of composition with a concise, convenient syntax that's akin to inheritance. For what it's worth, delegation is discussed in the Design Patterns book, and in fact, it's on the very same page as the principle of favoring composition over inheritance. Uh, it's the very next section. So if you've got a copy of the book and you're interested in learning more about delegation in general, you should give that introduction section a read through. And if you wanna learn more about class delegation in Kotlin specifically, you should check out chapter 13 of Kotlin and Illustrated Guide, where I cover this feature in length, including demonstrating how you can delegate to multiple objects and how you can handle conflicts when you've got interfaces that have overlapping function signatures and a lot more. So I will link to that chapter in the description. Also, before we wrap up, I'm happy to announce the date for our very first live stream. It's going to be Wednesday, July 24th at 10 o'clock a.m. U.S. Central Time. So in other words, it's going to be at the same time slot that the videos on this channel typically premiere. But next time, instead of being a pre-recorded video, we're going to do a live stream. And part of that live stream will include a question and answer section. So if you've got a question for me that you'd like me to answer on the live stream, click on the Q&A survey link in the description and let me know. Thanks again for hanging out with me today, and I will see you next time at the live stream.